Let me say thank you uh, to um, Dean Cochran and his team for inviting me to participate in this important conference, inviting me to be the closing speaker uh, just before your lunch. I think that <laughs> that's a, a bit challenging, but I will do my best. I will endeavor to do my, des my best. I acknowledge that we're on Mi'kmaq territory, and I'm grateful uh, to, to the Mi'kmaq and to all of my ancestors who uh, helped to make this province and this country what it is. I've set my timer. I want to talk for about 20, 25 minutes, and then have some time for dialogue. I love your title, Over the Horizon, The Future of Work and Learning and the opportunities for continuing education. I met with the planning team uh, several months ago, and at the end of that meeting, they said, we want you to be provocative. So I will say, if you like what I have to say, you can thank them. If you don't like what I have to say, <laughs> you can blame them. But I hope that I'm provocative, but I also hope that I'm inspiring. Because as Crystal said in her intro, I, I do, I, I myself, I am a lifelong learner. And I have a passion for teaching. And I see teaching as something that we do across the life span in all aspects of our lives. Not just in classrooms somewhere. We're always, we're always teaching. So I hope that I have something that I can offer you. And then the hashtag, lifelong learning lives here. You are all deeply committed to lifelong learning, which is absolutely wonderful. The title that I've given for this talk is Bridging Town and Gown, Continuing Education Programs Break Down Systemic Barriers. I think it's so important that we look at how continuing education can be so helpful and, and instructive to us in terms of breaking down barriers. So I hope to do some of that today. I hope that through this talk, I help you challenge the status quo. I want to engage you in some out of the box thinking. I want to begin by looking back so that we move forward to figure out how best to bridge town and gown, and exploring how we expand the reach of continuing education programs to do just that, to break systemic barriers. So I will start with a brief history of adult education as social transformation. I will talk a bit about the history of racism in the education sector itself, and then I'll conclude by talking a bit about that bridging, how we do, how I think we can do some of that bridging. Reflecting back, I, I looked at this uh, article by Careless, looking at bringing um, continuing education programs, adult education programs, into the social media world. I didn't pay much attention to the social media. I was more captured by the history and sort of thinking about adult education in Canada in those early years. For, the, for some of you, for many of you, I would assume in this room, the name Father Jimmy Tompkins won't be new to you. So thinking about his work, this, his seminal work, knowledge for the people. So there was a time early on in this country when knowledge for the people was the most important part of adult education programs. And then the Reverend Moses Cody, some of you may know. Anyone here from St. of X? So the Cody Institute, named after Reverend Moses Cody. And his emphasis was very much adult education as a movement adult education as a movement. Um, when people talk about <coughs> Father Jimmy Tompkins and Reverend Moses Cody, 
I don't see in those stories uh, the story of the Reverend Dr. William Pearlie Oliver. But he worked with those gentlemen as well. Not many people have written about his contributions to adult education, but he was instrumental in introducing adult education in the African Nova Scotian communities. And that work has almost gone invisible now. I think this work, this history, has as much relevance today as it did when these gentlemen were starting. Did you know, for those of you who's here from Atlantic Canada, did you know we have the lowest literacy rates in the country? There's something wrong with that Canada. There's something wrong with that Atlantic Canada. There's something wrong when we say, we stand here and say, we have the lowest adult literacy rates in the country. And then within that, we know that within that Atlantic Canada umbrella, we know that there are some groups that are even more marginalized than others in terms of uh, issues pertaining to literacy. So I think we should look back and maybe look back, where did we get it wrong? What steps have we missed? The Cody Institute is known around the world for its work. It's work in adult education. It's work in working internationally around leadership issues. It's work on gender issues. But their work done here in Canada is much less known and probably not as well funded. Somehow in Canada, we like to think that we are uh, wonderful when it comes to supporting the uh, underdeveloped countries. We have underdeveloped communities in this country that we ignore every single day, that probably need our attention more than some others. We make assumptions about what's needed in third world countries here in the first world. But I think there's more that we need to be doing here in the quote unquote first world. Two of the people who have absolutely influenced my passion for lifelong learning, for social justice education, for empowerment education, would be Paulo Freire, his work, and Bell Hooks. I never met Paulo Freire, but I did get to meet Bell Hooks. Uh, simply amazing, but their work. And look at the themes in their work. The pedagogy, pedagogy of the oppressed. His work with farmers and farm workers still holds up, I think, as some of the most amazing uh, adult education that we've ever done in the world. Literacy as knowing the world. Literacy as naming the world, naming our issues. When we can name our oppression, we can find a way through empowerment to get out of it. But if we don't even know what's happening to us, we, we become complicit in our own oppression. But Freer's work was action-focused and empowerment-focused. And then Bell Hooks. So Bell Hooks came to St. Mary's. Any St. Mary's folks here? No hands? Oh, my. Someone from St. Mary's brought Bell Hooks to Halifax a number of years ago, and it was an amazing, amazing evening. But um, the theme in her work that I want to pull on today is education as the practice of freedom. And she talks about bringing those voices from the margins who are typically not heard and not seen. Those marginalized uh, communities in Canada that are living in quote unquote third world conditions that nobody notices because we're doing really well in this country, right? 
But she also talks about education as resistance, so resistance to that oppression. And, and she talks about education, um, as, as I said, as the practice of freedom, but she also had action focused. I don't know if any of you have seen the work that she's done. She, there's, a, there's an article about she, with she and Paulo Freire in conversation. Have any of you seen that? I, I think it may be on video as well. I couldn't find the article as I was preparing for this, but it's, I remember um, reading it and using it years ago in teaching, and it's absolutely amazing. It was such a gift, such a gift to, to I, I, could just, I could just, as I was reading the article that came out of their dialogue, I could imagine them being in a room like this, having this dialogue in front of an audience and engaging about this whole issue around uh, education, education for the oppressed, <laughs> education as empowerment, education as action. When people are talking about educating, and, and this is a theme that comes out of the Cody work as well, you educate, and especially educating women, you're not educating them just for, them, for their own educational journeys. You're educating them for what they will do in their communities what they will take back to their families and to their communities. <clears throat> and that's what I, when I think about uh, adult and continuing education as action, those are some of the things that I think about. But then I say, well, what happened? What's happened in adult education and continuing education since then? Where did we go wrong? How did we lose that passion, that, I use the term, um, fire in the belly? Where's the fire gone from the belly? Why is it no, why are we why are we not angry and restless with what we know, with what we see that's going on in this world of adult and continuing education? Shifts happen. Is that one of your words I heard? <laughs> Dean Cochran. <laughs> Shifts happened. Shifts. <laughs> Shifts happened. Your colleges and universities, for the most part, community practitioners, there are a few community practitioners here. I'm going to acknowledge some of them later. But I think when adult and continuing education programs are, are run by universities and colleges, what happens? We become influenced by the dominant ideology of the, inst the very institutions that we're working from. We become a key part of the capitalist system that helps to keep that moving. When we lose the fire in our belly, we lose the, we lose the courage, I think, we lose the courage to take the kinds of stands that are needed to be advocating for education as the practice of freedom. We've put more focus on the values of production and competition and consumerism. Learners, students are now seen as consumers of knowledge. They're purchasing something for us. Just in the last few years, you know, as an academic in the last few years, I know that the, the, even the, the, the expectation between teacher and student has shifted, <coughs> has really shifted. I overheard a conversation between two students in a class I was teaching here on Dow campus this winter, and I was so annoyed because I heard these students talking and they were saying, Someone, one student was saying to the other, you haven't been here to class. And the student said, you know, I've done all of my assignments. So as far as that person was concerned, they'd met the expectations. I don't have to show up. I don't have to be in the classroom. What is there to learn from my peers? What is there to learn from the instructor, for heaven's sake? I walked away because I was too tired that night to deal with that. <laughs>
And I also knew that if I dealt with it in that moment, that it, it, there may have been a perception of bias when I graded that student's work. If I had challenged that student in that moment, I know there would have been a perception of bias. And I know, as a black woman professor, even though I'm no longer a full-time employee here, and believe me, I've had some of this happen already in other contexts, so I know when it flies, that I knew that someone would take something and put a spin on it that would be unbelievable. So I chose to walk away. And walking away was my action. So it's not that I didn't do anything. That was my action. So we've become too credentialized. So what's the impact of these shifts? What's the impact? I think that one of the major impacts that we see is that we, we have, I think, even more exclusion from folks who are already excluded. So the, there's a greater risk of exclusion. There's a greater risk of those systemic barriers keeping people out, keeping First Nations people out, persons with disabilities, the economically disadvantaged. When our price point on continuing in adult education is so high, that people can't even begin to figure out how they're going to pay for it. Then we've put a major systemic barrier in the way. And African Nova Scotians are amongst that group as well. But we can look at all of these intersections of oppression and exclusion. And I want each of you right now in the programs that you work in, the programs that you're involved with, think about who are the adults that are participating in your continuing education programs, in your adult education programs? Who are participating? And then I want you to think about who isn't. Who's not around those tables? Who's missing from your classrooms? And then I'll give, I'll give you a third thing to think about. What can you do about it? How can you reverse that shift? How can you turn it around? And what responsibility do you have to turn it around? So often, we look at the person next to us, at the person that we're reporting up to, it's so easy to look at everyone else for the solutions when maybe we have answers ourselves. When I think about the, in this province alone, I think about the segregated schooling that was legal until 1954. I went to a segregated school. I think about the residential schools and we're continuing, continually hearing about the multi-generational impacts on indigenous people, Métis people, Inuit people. Generations later, we're still dealing with the impact. So what we've seen is this, this, this huge lack of access. And we've seen communities, communities that are systemically marginalized, that are locked outside of systems that most of us take for granted. Then I think about people born into systemic oppression, people who are marginalized from the mainstream. When you're born into oppression, it starts from day one, even pre-birth. Depending on where you are in the country, depending on your race, depending on your gender, depending on your parents' access to things like clean water, to education, it all has an impact. Family, what happens in families, the lack of family 
friendly policies? What happens in the media? The messages. You don't ever see someone that looks like you. I have to stop here and tell you the story about my six-year-old grandson who has autism. His eight-year-old brother has an acquired brain injury. They were there when I was sworn in to the Senate. They've visited two times since then. So they're familiar with the Senate. The youngest said to me, said, Nanny, are there boy senators? And I said, oh yes, some of my colleagues are men. So he, then he says, okay, well Nanny, when I grow up, I'm going to be a senator. His reference point is that to be a senator, you have to be a black woman. <laughs> when you don't ever see anyone that looks like you in places that you might think about aspiring to, you don't ever aspire to go there. And it can be as simple as, do I see anyone that looks like me teaching in that program at community college, at the university? And if I don't, will I be welcomed there? Or if I don't, if I have an experience there that seems a little off, will anyone understand me when I mention it? If I dare mention it? And the answer is typically no. So in terms of life chances, then we see multi-generations of marginalization. We see limited, limited opportunities, limited access to opportunities, even for education that will position you for employment opportunities. We see a lack of expectations and I think that's probably one of the things that's most damaging. The lack of expectations. My 32-year-old niece graduated yesterday with distinction, with her bachelor's degree in social work. She was 14 years old when her mother died. She was in grade... Um, 10 or 11, exceptionally bright, but things really went off the rails when her mom died. She's a single parent. And at a dinner we had for her, she shared with her older brother, she said, you know, Dion, I haven't told you this. Her name is Danielle. Danielle says, Dion, I haven't told you this. When their father died, she was living in Virginia at the time, when her father died, Dion said to her, you know, Danielle, you have so much potential. And I believe if you went back to university, things can happen for you. And at the dinner, she said to Dion, she said, Dion, I haven't said this to you, but I want to say thank you for believing in me when I could not believe in myself. And so when I think about where do we start, that's a place, folks, that we can all start. When we believe in people's potential, when we enable them to believe in themselves, when we support them and mentor them and sponsor them, to get to where they want to be, it will make a difference. It will transform. It will really transform their lives. It will transform their lives, but not just their lives, the lives of others. So Danielle's goal is to, in the fall, she's going to be starting a master's degree in, in the Faculty of Medicine in community health and epidemiology because that's, that's my just, time. If that's Justin telling me busy. No, that's my time. <laughs> <laughs> I said I was going to talk for 20, 25 minutes, so I've done that. Um, we're finished at 11.30, yeah. so if I go for another 10 minutes, 
and then some time for some dialogue. Okay. I, I have to set the timer. Honestly, I could get really lost in the conversation. I'll jump through these and we're going to be put you're filming and we're going to be putting the slides in your follow up, whatever that is. So those barriers, I've talked about the barriers that people feel. And, you know, the low expectations and no expectations, that sort of thing. One of my students did the study that looked at specifically at this. And then we looked at supports. It's really about mentorship. Um, seeing that representation, seeing community, family, but also com having community-driven programs. So what's interesting in this particular study, and this was a study done with adults who were looking back at what helped them navigate through a system that was very unfriendly and unwelcoming, an education system, and, and they talked about community-driven programs. So how many of you are here who are working in community-driven adult or continuing education programs? So quite, quite a few. So that's, that's really encouraging. That's really encouraging because you know, we're hearing that community-driven programs are really, really important. One of the things I'd like us to think about is how we do the bridging. So bridging town and gown. How can we have stronger links, maybe, between community programs and university and college programs? How can college programs and university programs tap in more into uh, communities. I'm sure you've talked about the transition year program here at Dalhousie over the last week. I'm sure there have been a number of, of opportunities to talk about that program. When that program started on, what, 48 years ago now? That program was actually initiated by um, the late Rocky Jones, who was a civil rights leader, social justice advocate, and saw the value knew the value of education. And when the program first started, it was really geared to those adult learners who wanted to gain access to university. I think it's shifted over the years. And, and so I think that's an issue um, that we need to look at. Maybe the 50th anniversary coming up is a good opportunity to do some looking back. Looking back and looking forward. The Black Educators Association has adult education programs. You know, I'm thinking the programs that I'm familiar with here in, in Nova Scotia, but there's not, much, there's not been much uptake. It's not that there's not much need, but not much uptake. So we need to understand why that is. The Nova Scotia Community College had a transition program for African Canadians, and they had to shut it down because they didn't have enough uh, participation. And again, not because of lack of need. So we need to figure out how to do it better, how to make it tighter. The East Preston Empowerment Academy, and two of our people are here from that organization, that started in, in uh, 19. <laughs> we haven't been going that long. But um, the East Preston Empowerment Academy started back in 2014 as a way of addressing the needs around adult education, specifically in that community. And they are doing some amaz amazing things. But it was started by a, a pastor who was wanting to focus on empowering lives. I thought this had a, a pointer, but I guess it doesn't. Empowering lives through education. Education as the practice of freedom, education as empowerment, and also transforming the community. And they're doing all sorts of interesting things. If you haven't had it, we don't have time to see this video, but um, it'll be in your packet so you can go and look at that link. We did an evaluation of that program with some students from the School of Social Work, and I just want to highlight the two themes. Why adults were attending adult learning, Many talked about self-improvement and empowerment. So if we can get people at the right time, under the right conditions, there's an interest in adult learning. But they also talked about giving back, their interest and desire to give back to their community. 
and then the, the keys to success. What made the program so successful right off the start? They talked about it being a very safe learning environment. They talked about the teaching not feeling like teaching, but more as a mentorship and almost like a ministry. And they talked about leadership on many, many levels. So when I think about uh, all of those, all of those uh, themes, and I think about those keys to success, and I think, so, you know, how can we, how can we um, transfer that to a way to bridge? What can we learn? What lessons here to, for us in terms of learning how to bridge town and gown? So if we go back to some of that history, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. <coughs> we go back to some of that history. Education as the practice of freedom. Pedagogy of the oppressed. Education as empowerment. They were working. So think about the gaps that you see between you know what's needed. If you've, if you've thought about those questions I asked you to think about and had some answers in your mind, now think about, so, you know, what are the gaps? And how can we fill some of those gaps? How we bridge town and gown. I think one of the most important things we have to do I think one of the most important things we have to do in terms of bridging town and gown is making a commitment to do it. It will only happen because we make it happen. It will only happen when we say, you know what, we need to do something differently. If we've got some gaps that we want to fill, then how, how are we going to do that? What's my action? What's my action? You've had an amazing week in Halifax, an amazing week at this conference. You've had an amazing week living with the essence of lifelong learning, right? You've been here. Lifelong learning is living here. Lifelong learning is living in you. So how can you take those messages and turn them into actions that will help break the systemic barriers for the Canadians that we continue to exclude? That's on us. That's on us to do. So that commitment, I think building community partnerships and alliances is very, very important. So who do, you know, who do you partner with? Who's in your local community that you can partner with that can help you with uh, the, the, the goals that you want to set? And maybe starting um, Having a soft start. When I think about how we started with the East Preston Empowerment Academy, we started with an idea. And now that program has about five active programs. The most, you may have, some of you may have seen it in the news, those in Nova Scotia. The most recent program is a partnership with Irving Shipbuilding in the Nova Scotia Community College and the, uh, what do they call it? Um, the special program with shipbuilding. Oh my goodness. Help me out somebody. <laughs> it's not coming. It, it'll come before the end of the session for sure. Uh, but the, the work that they're doing, the center of excellence, that's it. What they're, they're with the, <laughs> I have to laugh at myself uh, so that you won't. <laughs> the center of excellence, what they're doing with the center of excellence, and they've done partnerships with, uh, with Mi'kmaq, They've done partnership with women, and their third partnership with the African uh, Nova Scotian community is with the East Preston Empowerment Academy, and there's spots for 20 people in the welding program. I think we're now up to about 65 applicants for those 20 spots. There's clearly a need for programs, clearly a need for programs like this, that will make differences in people's lives. So building partnerships. And then I think one of the other things that we need to make sure that we're doing is evaluations. We need to measure and document success. 
you know, when I was looking for uh, work, documentation of the work that Dr. Oliver had done, it was really painful not to find it. There's the next uh, time. It was really painful not to find it. So we need to do better at documenting part of what we do. And that's a note to self and to EPA for the board on Saturday, Dr. Palm. <laughs> we, need to, we need to do some documenting. So we've been documenting, but not in the literature and in the CE and, and adult ed world. You need that literature, right? Okay, so let me stop there.